Thanks. As Nazia said, I'm Jed Gross. I am a member of our bioethics program at UHN. When you imagine the ideal doctor-patient relationship, many of us may think of an individual patient receiving advice from an individual clinician. Transplant doesn't work quite like that. Um, because of scarcity, sometimes it's hard to get the therapy that the patient needs in a timely manner, and there are actually two patients, a donor and a recipient. For those reasons, this sometimes raises ethical questions, and the aim of my presentation today is just to show how we can do this responsibly. Um, the first transplants performed that could be called clinically successful used living donors. Um, in the early 1950s, dialysis was not yet readily available, and there was the ability to perform kidney transplants between identical twins. Um, it raised basic questions about the propriety of performing surgery on one person for the benefit of another. This wasn't entirely a novel problem. Skin grafting has a much longer history, but there was an additional layer because donors weren't interchangeable and some of the twins involved were, who had this opportunity were legal minors. Um, in North America, a series of cases in Massachusetts helped establish the best interest standard whereby the procedure of removing an organ from one person was justified not on the basis of the benefit to the other person, but on the basis of the psychological benefit that it might give the donor. Um, as Nazia and Sunita and Mark have indicated, there's a lot of evidence accumulating to suggest that that benefit is real. The photo on the left here shows Noah and Moira Johnson, the first kidney donor and recipient in Canada. Their transplant was performed in 1958, and the recipient sister lived almost 30 years with the new kidney. On the right, I probably should have coordinated with Sunita because <laughs> we both have photos of Ronald and Richard Herrick, two of the um, first Boston patients. And there they are examining a newfangled device called a dialysis machine. I can assure you if we had planned a little bit better, we could have found a more diverse group of patients in these early cases. Um, as transplantation and other forms of organ replacement therapy expanded through innovation, the field grappled with ethical questions. Um, beginning with the SIBA Foundation Symposium in London in 1966, clinicians sought to establish guidelines for ethical practice of transplant medicine. Some of the challenge was figuring out how to apply basic principles of surgical ethics, such as informed consent, to the novel and unusual context of transplant medicine. For example, how do we ensure that individuals won't feel pressured into donating against their will? One thing that transplant programs readily established was the desirability of having separate teams assessing and taking care of donors and recipients to avoid perceived tensions that might arise. Um, another thing that is typically done is if people feel they are uncomfortable, we remind them that at any time they can back out and we will give them a sort of alibi and say that the donor just was not medically suitable. Also, we want donors to ask questions and cont control the pace of this. It, it is a voluntary act. Um, while well-intentioned and an important commitment to taking ethics seriously, I think some of these early efforts to reach a consensus on some basic guide rails in hindsight might be criticized for not having sufficient engagement with patients themselves. Um, I can't promise that everything is perfect today, but we do try to include diverse stakeholders in transplantation when we're making policies now. Thinking about um, how the ethics of living donation have changed over the years, it's important to remember that transplant medicine itself is an evolving field. As recently as 1955, David Hume, one of the leaders in, in developing kidney transplantation, stated that it had no place in the therapy of human patients at this time. I don't think anyone would say that today in this field. Um, by 1968, people were saying, well, related donors are great, but unrelated donors, that's too risky. Immunosuppression wasn't very good, the outcomes were not as good, and perhaps there was an element of bias in assuming that a person donating to a relative had more at stake, and a person who was donating to a stranger was a little bit weird. 
today. <laughs> We've got a lot of data suggesting that um, living unrelated donations not only have better outcomes than transplants from deceased donors, but that in many cases they seem to be comparable to biologically related donations. Given that reality, um, we've become a lot more comfortable with the idea that anyone who has an emotional tie um, is doing a good deed by donating, and even people who want to donate to strangers, why wouldn't we want to accept that? Um, why wouldn't we want to encourage that? Changes in um, the eligibility for donation and the assessment process have not always entailed broadening who can donate. I think that with the introduction of dialysis, and better immunosuppression, the use of living immediate relatives became a little less acute, and as a result, we've become more conservative about utilizing young donors as donors. Um, that may also reflect an increased sensitivity to the time that it may take for adolescents to mature. Um, on the positive side, I think that um, we're now encouraging recipients, people on the wait list, to go out and actively seek out donors. For a while, we were uncomfortable with that in the field because there was a concern that seems misplaced in retrospect about queue jumping and the idea that some people might have better access than others. I think what we've now realized is that a living donor adds one organ to the pool and thereby shortens the wait list for everyone else. That said, we do want to make sure that we are also addressing barriers to access so that everyone who can benefit from living donation actually has that opportunity. UHN as an institution has established um, a set of guidelines for the evaluation of living donors. It was last updated in 2016. You can find this online on our bioethics website if you just Google it. Um, the guided guiding principles and values are listed up there. Respect for autonomy, as I mentioned, would include the freedom to change one's mind at any time or get more information. Um, beneficence means doing good. Non-maleficence is just a five-syllable word for doing no harm. A double equipoise is the idea that we're trying to balance benefit to donor and benefit to recipient. We don't want to be doing transplants unnecessarily. At the same time, if it really is the best chance, it's something that we're willing to go all out for. Um, Diversity, that's one word that I think in retrospect I might revise a bit and say respect for diversity. Our transplant program is not necessarily going out there and trying to promote diversity in society so much as we're trying to accommodate, accommodate all of our patients and their unique needs. Um, finally, the individual, the entire system is built on trust. That means both in being trustworthy in individual encounters and figuring out what might be systemic sources of distrust in transplant medicine or the Canadian healthcare system so that we can address them. Even a brief glimpse at the transplant literature will reveal in recent years a heightened interest in the concept of equity. How do we ensure fair access to transplantation in a diverse society? I would end this talk by positing that um, living donation is a special case because on the one hand we want to ensure that recipients of diverse backgrounds have equally good access to transplantation regardless of factors such as economic status, geography, um, ethno-cultural or religious background. At the same time, we have to do that in a way that doesn't compromise donors' autonomy. I think we're here today in part to figure out how to do that. <laughs>